Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, I got a lot to live up to now. Uh, and, and thank Bob and, and the, the, the Science Cafe. These guys do a, do a nice job, and, and uh, I think they all deserve a round of applause, too. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about what I do every day, but I also want to get into a little bit about what it takes to be a veterinarian. I want to touch a little bit about veterinarian technicians, which is a new kind of, a, not a new, but, a, but, but uh, recently a, a revived sort of profession that some of you might be interested in. Lots of people are interested in being veterinarians, and we're going to talk a little bit about maybe why that is and what it takes and maybe some of the more intimidating and less intimidating, intimidating aspects of veterinarian medicine, but a lot of just what I do every day. I think if you have questions, I'm, maybe just raise your hand. If I get a little bit behind, somebody will probably kick me, and maybe we'll have to move through some things, and we can maybe do questions at the end. But um, if, you have, if I say something that doesn't make sense or you'd like me to clarify something, just raise your hand, and I'll see if I can get to it. Um, this is my dog, Mick, at our clinic. And uh, so let, let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about, uh, um, about why I became a veterinarian. Whenever I get interviewed, people, they, they always, that, that's always the first question I get. Or did you want to be a veterinarian your whole life? And I would tell you that, that in, in my class in vet school, I could have probably gone through, uh, the, we had 128 at, at, at Colorado State when I was a freshman. And I'll bet probably 120 of them would have told you that, yeah, they wanted to be a veterinarian their whole life. That's, that tends to be the way it is. Uh, I, I, when I was young, I, I, like a lot of you, I loved animals. I always had something in a jar. I, I was always bringing home kittens and, and puppies to, to, uh, to, to the stain of, of my, my mom and dad. Um, I liked having animals around, and, and, and I still do. I, I imagine most of you do, too. They're, they're a fabulous part of our lives and, and really a, a, a real a, 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 a companion that I, I just I don't know how I'd get by without mine. Um, as I got older, though, I certainly found out that a lot of the stuff, biology is just the coolest thing. And I was, I was just intrigued by it. I, uh, watching a, a, a caterpillar change into a butterfly, those kinds of things, just knocked me out. And, and again, I think a lot of you are here for those kinds of same reasons. It is, it is really neat to be able, for me, to be able to take what I loved as a kid, animals and biology, and combine those into doing what I do. And I, I, I often think I've got the greatest job in the world. I've, uh, I, I, every day I get up and I, and I thank whoever's up there that I am a veterinarian, because this is, this is what, I, what I enjoy doing. And it's a fabulous, fabulous profession. And we'll talk a little bit about not the, the, the profession in general and other ways that if you get a degree in veterinary medicine that you can use that uh, not only just to practice like I do. Um, I got, when I got out of high school, I, I, uh, I started Ohio State University. Um, didn't do very well, quite frankly. And I took a few years off. I got a little bit better focused. And then when I, and I ended up out here in Albuquerque and started back to school at, at, uh, at the University of New Mexico. I'm a proud Lobo. And I graduated there in, in 1984, at which point I was, uh, I was accepted to Colorado State University's vet school and started there in, in, in 84 and graduated in 88. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about college and vet school, and it, and it is tough. It is tough, and you gotta, you've got to keep your grades up the whole time. But I, it, it's all a matter of focus, I, and, I, and I think about this a lot. That school isn't that hard. It's, it's, all, it's, it's just realizing what you want, focusing on it, and going for it, and, and keeping that vision ahead of you all the time. I think anybody here could, could, could pass all these kinds of tests and get through all these kinds of courses that it takes to be a veterinarian, but you've got to be focused. And part of the bad part, I think, truly, about, about getting into vet school um, is that you, you really have to have good grades all the time, which puts pressure on you from the very beginning. Um, this is me and my dog again. This is our treatment area. That's a Carol, one of my technicians. And again, I'm going to talk a lot about veterinary technician. There's actually two veterinary technician schools in this state. There is no vet school here. You have to go to Colorado State is, is the one most of us end up at. Uh, but there are, there are two, one down in Albuquerque at, uh, I think that's called the Central New Mexico College, now CNM. Um, and then there's one, uh, one that you can do online. Becoming a veterinarian technician is, is, is a viable option. It's, it's, a, it's a reasonable job these days. People are getting paid better and, and respected more and, and, and getting much, much more uh, kinds of, uh, of, of jobs and, and responsibilities. So basically, we're going to talk about vet school first. And, uh, 
You know, I, I think people usually see this organic chemistry, and that's the end of it. And they, they, they go figure, I'll do something else. And organic chemistry is hard. Chemistry is hard. All these things are, 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 are tough courses. But again, it's just a, just a matter of focus. And, and, and again, when I started college, when I got out of high school, and I didn't do very well, I got D's in chemistry. And I, and I was miserable. And I took, and, uh, and, I, and I probably wasn't a very good student either. But I took a few years off. I traveled a little bit. I got... I, I kept that dream in my head, but when I went back to school, things were just so much different for me. I, I, I realized what I wanted, and I had been working construction for a couple of years, and that's hard work, and I realized there's got to be a better way to make a living than this, and I really wanted to go back to school. So when I, when I did get back to college, it was just a whole different thing for me, and I, I did very well, but it was all a focus thing, and again, I think that that's it's an important lesson for all, for all of you guys, too. Uh, the, the test we take after you finish, so you have to go through basically four years of undergrad. There, there's all these requirements you need to even apply to vet school. And by the time that you get all those requirements done, you've probably pretty much got a bachelor degree. Almost everybody gets a bachelor degree before they get into vet school. You need to take this GRE, which is a pretty tough test. It isn't like the MCAT or the, 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 vet, the school to get into law school or the med school. It is kind of general. There is questions on geometry, and, and it's, a, it's a tough, tough test. And it, and I, I didn't feel like I did very well, but it was good enough, obviously. It's a hard test. So there are 28 schools in, in the United States. Out west, there aren't many. There is, there's not one in New Mexico. There is not one in, in Arizona. There's one in Colorado, Colorado State. And we are fortunate enough here in, in the state of New Mexico to have, uh, have a relationship with, with, with Colorado State where if you are accepted, and there's a program called the WICHE program, you get to go to Colorado State and pay in-state tuition. Still not cheap, but it's much better than paying out state tuition. So most, most students from this area end up at Colorado State. Probably, oh, 75% of the veterinarians who practice here in Santa Fe and in, in, in the Albuquerque area uh, went to school at Colorado State. There are a couple of Canadian schools, um, and, and, and they're good schools. And there's, you can go to school. I've, there's a good friend of mine who, who practices in Pecos who actually went to school in Mexico. So you can, you can do that. There are, there are a lot of different options to, to get this done. Eventually, though, you have to, you have to take the, the boards. You have to, if you, if you practice, if you go to, go to a, a foreign school, there's, there, it's, it's pretty tough. You have to take all these extra tests. But again, a lot of people do it, and it can be done. So I, and I got this from, from the AVMA's, uh, uh, the American Veterinarian Medical Association's website. And, and 3.6, that's probably pretty average. I'll tell you, I don't know anybody who got into my class that had less than a 3.8, quite frankly. It is competitive, and it gets worse. So, I mean, I don't, I don't say that to discourage you, but you've got to remember, when I, was, when I was going to UNM, if I was two or three weeks into a class and wasn't sure I was going to get an A, I'd probably drop that class and try to pick it up next semester. It is that competitive. You want to get A's all the time. I probably shouldn't tell you that, but I think, I, I, it's, 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 unfortunately, it's a fact. You just got to concentrate. You just got to focus. You can do it. Um, yeah, and this is to get into vet school then. Um, should we get more chairs? Is everybody going to? You guys all right standing over there? There's some room to sit up here in the front if you'd like to sit on the floor. When you, when you apply to vet school, and that application was one of the harder things I had to do. They look certainly at your grades. That's a big important thing. They want to see what, what kind of person you are what you've done, what kind of volunteer work you've done. They want to make sure that you're a pretty good human being to begin with, that you've got the grades, and that you know what you're getting into. So the fact that you, they, they want you to work at clinics, and you will not get into vet school unless you've spent a fair amount of time in a vet clinic. Because for them to give you a seat and, and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to give you this spot for four years to come through our school, and a lot of it is money. If, they, if you drop out after their, your first year, they've got an empty chair and they don't have anybody bringing in that tuition. So they want to make sure that, that, that you're convinced about what you want to do and that you know what it's all about. And, and I think that's really important. It isn't all uh, puppies and kittens. There's a lot of vomit and diarrhea. So you, you, you have to be comfortable with all those kinds of things. Krista, my, uh, my technician, knows all about that. She, she, she gets to clean that up usually. I don't have to clean that up anymore. But I did. I did a lot of it. And I worked in... In, in a lot of clinics in, in Albuquerque, when all, all through uh, my undergrad at UNM, I worked in a clinic there every weekend and every night I could get away. I was there and putting in the time, and that's, that's what you got to do. And it's for a good reason. You really, 
I, I think like, like a lot of professions, until you've really done it, you don't really know what it's about. And that's, that's a very important thing if you want to dedicate your life to something like veterinary medicine. Okay, I'm okay. So um, to be a veterinarian technician, you don't need this kind of college work. It, it, it's, it's a much easier type of, of, of requirements, although not terribly easy. They want you, they want you again, to, be, to have, a, have a good feeling for communication, math. You have to do a, Math is important all the time. I'm, I hate to tell you all that, but you know, figuring out drug dosages and, and converting pounds to kilograms and, and all that stuff is, is, uh, takes math, and it's obviously very important. Uh, uh, a, 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 uh, you, you miss a decimal somewhere and you give an animal 10 times the amount of, of anesthetic agent, that, that's, that's obviously a horrible thing. So obviously we're cross-checking and going over all that all the time, but the bad news is math is always going to be important, so I have to keep up with that. Um, and then, and then the, the basic requirements for that, do we have a math on that? Yeah, so you get an associate's degree, and you can usually do that in a couple of years. Some of those schools take three, and I think there's one in Colorado that actually takes four. Um, it's all good stuff. You learn, you learn a lot of, of good things. And, and do we have that slide about what technicians do? Is that coming up on the... No, that's okay, because I'm... All right, so here's what veterinary technicians do. We have... There, there's a lot of people who work at clinics that, are, that we call veterinarian assistants. A veterinary technician is different. That's a profession. These people monitor themselves. They have an association. They pay dues. Uh, they, they have a title. And so it's a good thing to do. Uh, and again, I've got, I probably have 20-some employees at my clinic. Uh, and, and a lot of them are, again, just they, they help here and there. But we have some that are, that are actual technicians. You get paid more money. It's, it's, a, it's, a, reasonable, it's a reasonable profession. And it's a good way to, to, to spend your whole life if you love animals and, and, the, and the rigors of, of veterinarian medicine, becoming a veterinarian. Maybe you don't want to do, get, get into that kind of commitment. Again, a technician is, is a really cool thing to do. I've got some pamphlets up here. Don't let me forget to pass those out, too, because they, they go over a lot about this and show you some websites you can get on for some more information. But some of the things that my technicians do, they help me with, with, with keeping records. Records is, is an important part and something I do very poorly case histories, collecting specimens, drawing blood, running that blood on our, on our machine. So we've got a very cool clinic, and we'll, we'll show you that some of our, our uh, uh, pictures of our clinic. But we can get a sample of blood and, and, and run it through. I can know a BUN and a white blood cell count and a pack cell volume in a matter of minutes. So we can do some, some very quick, and that's kind of what we have to do. We have to, we have to be working fast a lot of times in veterinary medicine. And, and again, I'll go through some areas why that's important. Um, nursing care. You know, you, you, you just you cannot put a value on that. It's, it's extremely important. A, a lot of the things that I will do in surgery, it makes no difference if I put them in a cage and, and there's nobody watching them to make sure that the things are going right, that they're getting their fluids and their medications and all these other important things. Um, this is a big one, and we'll show some slides of, of, of our techs getting animals ready for surgery and, and keeping the instruments all clean and ready and sterile. Um, radiographs. And, 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 and all, all these, these really cool new, new diagnostic techniques we have, ultrasound and, and, and uh, endoscopy, uh, we, we depend a lot on our, our technicians to be uh, helping out with that. And then dentals, um, we do a lot of dentals. Dogs have bad teeth just like humans. And I'll, and I'll say, maybe I'll say this a couple of times, but I think th there are two things. In my 20 years, I've been trying to put together this philosophy of why some dogs live a long time. Why do I see those 16 and 17-year-old dogs? And then some dogs die at 8 or 9. And, and then breed differences and size and all those kinds of things play into that. But a couple of important things for me that, I've, that I think that, that has, has always been ringing true is good weight. Keep your dogs and cats lean. There is no benefit to these guys getting heavy. At least, you know, once a month, somebody will bring me in a dog and say, I think he's got worms, I can't put weight on him. And these dogs are usually in perfect health. Or they're thin. There's nothing wrong with having your dog thin. Uh, I, I tell people that, that when you see that coyote hopping down the road, your dog, that, that's, your dog shouldn't be far off from that. That is a good, healthy animal. And, and having those guys and being able to easily feel their ribs and having them in good muscle structure is the way they'll, they'll live long. And the other thing I think is important is good oral health, having clean teeth and clean, clean healthy gums. And that is, that's, that's a little bit tougher, but it certainly can be done. And we do, we do an awful lot of these dental uh, prophylactics at our clinic. Um, are we going to go to the movie? Yeah. 
Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, what I want to do now is, is show a movie, and it's about a half hour long. The AVMA put this out. What it's going to do is kind of give us an idea about, uh, about some of the other areas that you can go into with a degree in veterinary medicine. Um, it, it, it is going to concentrate a lot, of, too, on, on what I do, but also some of the different areas of, of, of research and, and academia. So uh, we'll try to roll that. I'm not sure. We're working. We're efforting that. Uh, and Chris, if I holler at you to stop it at some point, can you do that for me? Okay, so again, this is, a, this is a movie about veterinarians. I can't remember what it's called, but I think they'll probably pop that up here in a matter of seconds. Minutes. It won't be long. Well, I can keep talking because I don't mind. Um, so maybe a little bit more about, about the colleges in this area. There's also a, a, a college in Texas, Texas A&M. Uh, there's two colleges now in California, uh, one in Davis and, and a brand new college, the newest college in the United States, which is the first time we've had a new vet school in about uh, 15 years. Um, it's, it's a whole different concept about how to, how to teach veterinary medicine and probably the future of veterinary medicine, I think. They don't, have, they don't really have classes. They, uh, you, you do your anatomy and your physiology your first couple of years, and then you get ship, shipped out to different clinics and different hospitals where you learn the practical end of veterinary medicine, which as, like in a lot of professions, and when I, when I have my new students come in, um, are you ready? No. You, huh? No. Yes? No? Okay. We, will we be ready at some point? Oh, Okay. Good, I've got more time. When I, get, when I get my new students or my new young veterinarians coming in, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty blunt with them, telling them that, that they've got a head full of knowledge and, and all this kind of cool stuff, but truly they know nothing. Veterinarian medicine, like a lot of medicines, is, is truly an art. And what, the hard part about all this is taking a case, getting the information from the, from the client about how this animal is truly doing, and then trying to, trying to put all that into the big picture with all this knowledge that you have in your head about, about disease processes and, and bacteria and, and, uh, and treatments and such. And um, I'll just keep talking, Krista? All right. All right, here we go. It's More Than You Think, that's the title here. You aren't going to be able to see. You're not going to get credit for this now. You're all right. It's not that good. I've watched it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Everybody hear that? Do we have more volume? I could narrate it, I guess. Can you hear it at all? You want, is this worth doing? Oh, can I, can I put this on there? Can, can we use this microphone? That picture they showed was a human chest. I don't know why that was on there, but. Krista, can you stop this at a point? I want to. I want to point something out here. Not. Not yet. All right, hold it right here. Can you pause that?
Back it up just a bit, Chris, if you could. I want to. So this is a large animal vet. Um, and you know, when I was in vet school, we, all, we had to take everything. I had to learn everything, horses and cows and chickens. Um, even, even though I intended to just to do dogs and cats. Uh, these days, there is so much information out there that, that you, you kind of pick a, pick a path now. So your sophomore year of vet school, at least at Colorado State, you decide I want to do horses, I want to do farm animals, I want to do companion animals. And, and you make those, those uh, kinds of what we call tracks. So that as your last couple of years, you're focusing a little bit more on, on, on what you really intend to do when you get out. And that is for no other reason that there is just too much information. And, and this, this whole thing that they described when I was in vet school is the information explosion. And they, they told us information was, was doubling at about every eight years. It's down to like every two or three years now that the stuff we know is, is double. It's twice as much. So to, to continue to get through this in four years, it, uh, it just wasn't working. So, so they, obviously we don't study some of the things that we used to and we concentrate on some other areas, but also you, you, find, a, you find a track that you like. Colorado State is really big into horses, and, and a, lot of, a lot of my uh, 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 classmates ended up in, in the equine medicine. Did you ever consider exotics? And I did exotics for, for a while. When I, when I was down at, UN, at, at UNM and living in Albuquerque, I worked at the Rio Grande Zoo. That's every Saturday morning I would go in there, and I remember chopping up mice for things. And that was a real hard thing after uh, a, a late night on Friday night. But, um, I, I, I really and truly and still do really enjoy uh, different species of animals. And, and the zoo medicine is, it w would, be, it would be the best thing for me, but it's, I don't know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons I, I, I didn't follow that track. But, but when I came to Santa Fe, that's really one of the reasons I came here, because nobody was doing birds up here. And, and uh, uh, I, there was a clinic open, and they'd asked me to come up. And, 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 and again, with my, at that point in my career, I, I really wanted to do birds. I still see a, a rabbit and a ferret here and there, but mostly what I do is dogs and cats. Um, but, you know, an, an iguana walks in occasionally, and a lot of those we start referring because, I, there, again, so much information, and I just don't have the time to keep up on it. And if you're not keeping up on it, then maybe you're not, you're not doing your clients the best that you can do. So a lot of those I'll refer. You want to go ahead and move this? I just want to, oh, I think it was, we already passed that. I wanted to, I wanted to show the sleeve. Yeah, could you back it up just a bit? So again, large animal cattle stuff, and I didn't think I'd like this. I had no experience with cattle when I got into vet school, but I, I, I just loved it. I loved the cowboys going out with them. They're all great guys and, and, and ladies. Um, and, and the, the, you know, it's, it's always outside. Uh, There's a lot of fresh air. And uh, you're going the wrong way, I think. Oh, now you're all going to know the answer to this pop quiz. I probably shouldn't have done this. But at any, any rate, uh, um, we're having some technical issues. Maybe I should skip what I was going to talk about. And can you get back to the? Just go right back to the beginning if you can. Oh, this is good. There we go. All right. Well, I'm going to talk why this gets up to where I wanted to. <laughs> well, why don't we just go here? I'll talk about what I want to talk to later because it's kind of cool. We got speakers now? Is it? We still don't have any sound? Well, I really thought this movie was a good idea at one point. <laughs> well, I'll go ahead and tell you what I was going to talk to you about. So in, in, in cattle, in large animal, um, and, and, and when, when you're doing cattle work, it is one thing. You want to get these guys grown up and to market. Uh, that's, that's kind of a, for you vegetarians out there. Uh, or or in, in the dairy field. I mean, they are there to produce meat and milk for us. And that's uh, a lot of the things that we do as veterinarians really concentrates on, 
on getting those guys to that point as, as, as quickly and as healthily as, as we can. But, um, and maybe we'll show this, but one of, one of my favorite things was, was what's called rectal palpation. And it, is, it, it sounds terrible, and it, and it kind of is, but it's very, very cool. So you wear these long sleeves, and one of the things that you will do to, to determine if a cow is pregnant, which is in, so they will have these cows, like a, a thousand of them, all lined up in these head things, waiting up, and you go on the, on the, on the back end of the cow, pull up that tail, and put your, your arm all the way up to your shoulder, and it's anus, and it's rectum, <laughs> and it's colon. And, and you're, what you're attempting to do is feel the ovaries, and you can feel the uterus. And uh, the, the guys who are good at this, they can, they can tell you, and I got to be pretty good towards the end of it, but it, it, uh, one thing I always, I always enjoy, because a lot of times in Colorado, I was, I was out doing this on, on those really cold winter mornings, and, and there's nothing warmer than having your arm halfway in a nice warm cow. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but it, but, it, but it really isn't that bad. What do you think? I'm going to plug in these speakers. Just don't trip on the cord. I won't. So there's this picture when that's a large animal woman. I'll show you. I'll show you the, the the appropriate sleeve. But it's amazing the information we do this in horses too to determine to determine pregnancy. And people again who are good at can tell you how far pregnant they are, when they're gonna when when to expect the colt or the full. Uh, and so you can get a lot of information uh, uh, from from the rectum of a cow or a horse. It's a good thing I had Christy here because if I was doing this. We focus on anatomy of tears and dispenses for their surgery. Veterinarians also work in areas in which animals affect society, such as the food supply. Other veterinarians are like detectives. So where are we, though? We're about halfway? All right. No matter what you're in, there's a place for you in veterinary medicine. Test your veterinary knowledge. What was the first animal domesticated by humans? You guys got an idea? The dog. Somebody said the dog. I kind of thought the cow or the yak myself. He's pressing that hoof to see if it hurts anywhere. Try to determine what the problem is, why the horse is lame. And she can't tell me where it hurts. So for me, it's a challenge to try to find out where it hurts. And here we'll crank that leg up really tight for, for a time to mount and then run them to see if they limp on that leg to try to determine which joint's bad. Small animal practices. 
I practice small animal medicine, primarily dogs and cats. The reason I chose this field is a great variety. I can practice medicine, radiology, surgery, almost any field on my patients in my hospital, and it's a great field. Veterinary practices come in all shapes and sizes, from single doctor practices to multi-veterinary hospitals. A veterinary practice is really a healthcare team. Dennis Hopper Kemp, anybody's in here right now? Andrew, you've got two dental for you today, right? Great. Other members of the team may include veterinary technicians, animal attendants, and receptionists. What do you think? Uh, Used to be dogs, but. Cats. Uh, I think cats. <laughs> According to the American Veterinary Medical Association, there are nearly 62 million pet dogs in the United States, but more than 70 million pet cats. 70 million cats in this country.
She sent samples of the bird tissues to labs all over the country. Finally, scientists identified the culprit. West Nile virus. The same virus was affecting both birds and humans. We've had several deaths in this state from West Nile. It's, it's, it's all over the country now. That's a pig doctor, we call him. Extracurricular activities in high school and college. 
the admissions committee will look carefully at your application for this type of experience. You may have heard rumors that veterinary school is too expensive or too hard. Veterinary school is no more expensive than medical school or other graduate schools, and there are many opportunities for financial aid. As for the hard part, well, if it wasn't challenging, you wouldn't be called doctor when you graduate. Plus, the rewards of veterinary medicine make it all worthwhile. Okay. So I always thought that medical students had it pretty easy and that they had to study one species, that being humans, and that's when we had to study dogs, cats, horses, birds, cows, the list goes on. So there's an awful lot of information to absorb and retain. Do you like puzzles? Do you like finding out how and why things work? Veterinary medicine allows you to solve puzzles every day. The first phase of veterinary school is spent learning how animals and medicine work, and how and why veterinarians treat animal diseases. Muscle values will then start to converge with the tendon. The tendon will pick up out here, and then the right over the top of the cutting is here. These are the critical pieces of the puzzle that help everything else fall into place. After you've learned the basics, it's time for some hands-on learning. It's what students have been waiting for. More contact with live animals. It's a thrill to do your first veterinary exam on a patient. So, Students receive instruction and support from veterinarians who have chosen to teach. So you got to get you the right kidney there. So what you want to do now is turn that into a transverse section. Turn 90 degrees. Until it's time for students to be on their own, or almost on their own, you're never truly alone now. Because your fellow veterinarians are always going to help, even after you graduate. Probably the most rewarding part of being a veterinary student is that day, four years after you started, when you walk out onto the graduation stage, they call you by name, call you doctor, shake your hand, and send you out into the real world to do what you always wanted to do. Where did it all start? The first school of veterinary medicine was established in the only plant in 1768. There you go. Usually because people think of all the great things that a veterinarian does for their pet. Boy, imagine how much respect veterinarians would get if people knew all the things they were interested in. For instance, do you know what veterinarians have to do with human health? A lot. And that link is more important than you might think. The well-being of animals matters for the health of people. It's easy to see how important pets are to the people we care about. Animals can contribute to the health of older people and those recovering from illness. They provide independence to those who need a helping paw and can act as a great motivator to even the most reluctant breeder. Animals help keep us safe, too. Police dogs protect their farm and help catch the bad guys. Other dogs are trained to detect the smell of bomb materials or drugs. But the interdependence between humans and animals can sometimes be a cause for concern as well with emerging infectious diseases and the fact that so many of these emerging viruses are zoonotic, meaning they affect animals and people. Veterinarians are going to play a critical role in the recognition, diagnosis, and understanding 
of some of these novel disease threats. Rabies, West Nile virus, and avian flu are examples of zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that are spread through contact with infected animals or insects. Zoonotic diseases are a particular concern in regard to our national security. 70% of known bioterror threats, such as anthrax and Ebola, which can be deadly, are zoonotic diseases. These zoonotic diseases are extremely important for animal populations and for you and I. I serve as a state veterinarian, and there are one of us in each of our 50 states. And we work with a list of these diseases that are extremely important. So when they become identified, we can respond rapidly to make sure we not only have healthy animals, but you and I stay healthy as well. We work closely with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the Food and Drug Administration, to make sure these diseases are rapidly identified and quickly removed from our populations, so you and I stay healthy. People and animals may share diseases, but they can also share the cures. We bridge the gap between humans and animals. I mean, we have a better background in animals that medical doctors wouldn't necessarily have. When Triumph the dog needed new back legs, Dr. Robert Taylor, you may know him from Animal Planet, gave her permanent artificial legs. Triumph's case is being studied by human doctors and will be used to help people who have lost their legs. Veterinarians have been pioneers in many areas of treatments and research that have been translated to human health. Examples include hip replacement surgery and the use of metal plates, pins, and wires to repair broken bones. Which of these was improved and made more useful by a veterinarian? A. A hypodermic syringe, or B. The first practical inflatable tire. Yeah, trick question. Oh, you can't be wrong. Military veterinarians? Are there animals in the military? You bet there are. They're some of our finest soldiers, and military veterinarians take care of them and do much more besides. We are now actively involved in homeland defense discovering and protecting the population against emerging diseases. Whether it's in uh, Baghdad, Iraq, or whether it's in the former Soviet Union, or whether it's in Frederick, Maryland, they've had the opportunity to really do some things that have made a difference for the security of the country. Did you know that it was a veterinarian who discovered the Ebola virus? And another veterinarian who discovered how to screen for HIV blood samples? Small animal practice? Swine, equine, dairy, aquatic animals, surgery, pathology, academia, the military. Can there be anything else veterinarians do? As a matter of fact, yes. In the devastating aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, these members of the Veterinary Medical Assistance Team were treating individual animals and addressing the public health issues that arise following disasters. Everything from mosquitoes carrying disease displace wildlife. Veterinarians are also intimately involved in the making of laws and regulations that cover everything from restaurant inspections to the movement of food animals that cross our borders every day. From protecting your town against rabies to providing for the humane treatment of animals, veterinarians work at every level of government. You can see them in the U.S. Senate, the governor's office, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Right down to your own local government, veterinarians are there to serve the needs of our society. There have even been veterinarians in space. A veterinarian won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1996. A veterinarian has appeared on the cover of Time magazine. And a veterinarian has been Miss America. Some veterinarians choose to apply their scientific training to research at universities, government agencies, or an industry. They're dedicated to finding new ways to prevent and treat injuries and diseases in animals and humans. And every time you visit a zoo, a circus, or a wildlife refuge, remember that there are veterinarians working behind the scenes to keep those exotic animals up with too. Even the most unusual animals have medical needs just like the rest of us. 
What should you do if you're considering a career in veterinary medicine? Those in the know offer a little advice. I can't think of a more exciting field than veterinary medicine. Setting your dream, follow it. Contact the veterinarian or others involved with this profession and find out how you can become involved. If your interest is research, public health, or biomedicine, veterinary medicine is a part of those fields too. So please consider veterinary medicine. We'd love to have you as part of our team. My advice would be to really pursue that dream even when things get tough. Stay focused. Stay under the broad your horizons and have fun as you go along. Realize that it's not out of your league, um, it's not about grades. I think it's more about how badly you want something. If I did it, you can do it. The possibilities in veterinary medicine are almost endless. The more we understand about life on this planet, the more we appreciate the connection between all animals, the two legged, the four legged, many legged and no legged varieties. Veterinary medicine works to keep us all safe, strong, and healthy. Veterinary medicine, it's more than we thought, but now we know. Okay, it's more than you thought. You know, and, and again, a lot of, a lot of points that, that, that come out of these kinds of things. Well, one, and I tell people this all the time, that veterinarians aren't, aren't people who, who couldn't get into med school. You know, the, when, I, when I started vet school, uh, they, were, they were the smartest people I'd ever met, my classmates. Because I was a pretty smart guy when I got there. I was just an average student in vet school. It was, it was kind of humbling, but, but uh, again, very, very sharp people who end up in this field. And they're, they're all kind of... Uh, working behind the scenes and doing a lot of really, really cool things in research these days. A lot of the cancer medicine that, that, that we depend on as humans is worked out on, on, on animals. Colorado State is, is, is really heading up that. They've, they just finished a, a $30 million cancer research center, and it's a, it's a phenomenal facility. And, and they mostly look at animals, but almost all the stuff that we look at, because we're really similar. I think uh, you know, certainly to a, to a dog, our digestive tracts and, and bone structure, all this stuff is very, very, pretty much the same. Uh, so a lot of the information that we can get out of studying how these different te techniques and medicines and chemotherapeutic agents work on animals, we can, we can uh, transfer that to the human side. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit now about, uh, about the clinic and what we do at the clinic. Um, if anybody has any questions, I, I, I'll, I'll maybe take a few now. Okay, so let's, let's work into, uh, uh, this is kind of what I did, and maybe not terribly exciting for you, but uh, well, I graduated from Colorado State. I went back to Albuquerque and actually worked at the practice that I had worked at as an undergrad, and it uh, wasn't a really great practice. You know, in retrospect, it maybe wasn't my, one of my finer decisions, but I just kind of thought I could change things, and after a while I decided I couldn't. I, I practiced there a year, and then I, I'm, I was offered a job at uh, the Rodeo Plaza Veterinary Clinic here in Santa Fe. And it was kind of the, the, the guy who owned it told me I could pretty much run it myself. He wasn't going to be there. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. I always like to be the boss. I wasn't maybe completely ready, but, uh, but I, I worked at that clinic for a year. And because it was a slow clinic and I, I needed more money, and the shelter didn't have a full-time vet at that point. Uh, the shelter, as you know it now, you guys all see that, that the, the Taj Mahal, we call it out there. What a fabulous facility it had. When, when I started, it was not quite like that. It was over on Sirius Road, and it was kind of dark and small, very happy and very pleasant, and, and we did a lot of very, very cool things there, but nothing like the facility we had there. I, um, I want to talk about the shelter for just a second, though, because I, I, I did spend a, a long time there, and it had a 
pretty profound effect on me because I was a, I was a, uh, I'd only been out about a, a year and a half when I started as their vet. And, and the, the one thing that I, that I did see and that, I, that I'll probably mention many times here is spaying and neutering your pet is, is really an important thing. I euthanized about 10 animals a day, seven days a week. I would go into that shelter and, and, and kill a perfectly healthy dog and cat, 10 of them every day. I did that for, for about three years, thousands and thousands of animals. And it's a, I don't, when I think back about those times now, because I, I, I euthanize animals all the time now, and, I, and people say that must be the hardest part of your job, but it's not. Uh, it is one of the most humane things I do. I, I, I really feel like I'm, I'm doing the right thing when I'm euthanizing an, an animal that is sick and is injured and that there's no quality of life. But at the shelter, that's different. There's an awful lot of pets here, and, and, and considering the, 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 we are the most educated and finest country on this planet, it's kind of, kind of a black eye, and I think that uh, you know, a lot of times I'd be at that shelter and people would say, well, we don't want to get our dog spayed because we want them to experience, well, my kids to experience the, the, the magic of, of birth. And, it, you know, and I always wanted to bring them back in the back and, and let them experience the magic of death because it, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible thing that goes on. So, again, spaying and neutering your pet. Pet population is a big thing now, and we're, we're doing, doing a, a much, much better job certainly here in Santa Fe. We're actually, uh, we actually take pets in from other areas now because, because we uh, have done such a, a, a fair job. We still got a lot of work to do. But, but uh, again, the shelter is, is a marvelous place. If you're out there, spend some time, volunteer there. Uh, you meet really great people and, and, again, get to be with animals, which is always a great thing. Um, in 1993, when I was practicing here in, in town here, I realized that a lot of my good clients came from the El Dorado area. So when, when I decided to, to, to open my own clinic, I kind of looked out there and, and was fortunate to find a, a nice piece of land. This is, this is a revision. The, 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 I actually kind of worked out of a trailer when I first started there. I, I look pretty sharp now. but. Um, when we first started there, we had a pretty small facility, and, and uh, you're there, we work with appointments, and then um, my, my, uh, my assistants from that, Krista, would, would come up and put you in a room, get you weighed, try to figure out what you, what you need, why you're there, get started on the records, and then, uh, and then the veterinarian would come in. This is, this is one of our exam rooms. We have four of these, and uh, this is where most of the work goes on. So in here, what I'm doing basically, and then there's a lot of I'm giving vaccines, and we're doing what we call wellness exams, and these animals are, are fine. We're just checking them up once a year to make sure their weight's good and their teeth is, are good and that there aren't any problems. They're not lame or vomiting or diarrhea or any of the, any of the, the common problems that we can hopefully take care of. Um, but quite often what we're doing is, is trying, to, trying to take, like these people talked about earlier, a puzzle and getting as much information as I can from the owner, and that's... And again, I tell a lot of my, my, uh, my, my newer colleagues, that's the trick to this, is try to, try to talk to the owner, because owners usually know a lot more than they realize they know, but asking the right questions is really the hard part, and trying to find out uh, the, 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 the symptoms ap apart from, from really what's going on and what is just secondary to something else. This is our pharmacy. We've, we've got just about every kind of medicine that, 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 uh, you're, that you'd have at the, at the human pharmacy. We've got chemotherapeutic drugs and certainly lots of antibiotics and, and all the things that we need, wormers, to, to try to keep the animals healthy. Um, and this is our treatment area. So if it requires treatment, then we come back here. We've got three of these what we call treatment tables. And that's where we, we prep, prep the animals for surgery here, and we'll see a little bit of that. We uh, draw the blood. We uh, do all the kinds of things that we need to try to, try to get to the answers we're seeking. Um, and this is surgery. And obviously, in surgery, we do surgery. And it's, uh, it's really a, a, a nice facility. We worked very hard at getting a, a good uh, uh, operating room with windows so that we could kind of uh, have some natural light in there. Um, we do a lot of very cool surgeries here. Uh, there, there's... When I first started, again, I keep going back to, but when I first started, there, there were no specialists. My, my first couple of days of school, I took a cataract out. I did a, I did a, uh, um, a, a pinned bone, stuff that I probably wouldn't do anymore. I definitely wouldn't try a cataract anymore, but there was nobody else. If I didn't do it, it wasn't going to get done. Now in this, in this state, in Albuquerque and, and moving up here, we have board-certified board specialists. So people who do nothing, we have board-certified ophthalmologists, oncologists, uh, several surgeons, uh, dermatologist, 
uh, so all, and internists. So when we get these really, really tough cases, we now have, we now have some options that we can do with them. And th that's all happened because, because of you people. You have animals and you want the best. And, and just, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, casting a broken leg and having it, having it uh, heal kind of poorly and having that animal limp the rest of its life, which would have been a pretty common thing, and the animal would have done fine 20 years ago. But these days, we can put that together and, and, and put a plate on it and, and get this guy back to, to health like it never even happened. So there's a lot. I think, again, the, the future for, for this profession, for medicine in general, for all of, all of us, we're all going to live a lot longer than our parents did. A lot of neat things coming down, and, and veterinarians are right in the middle of all that. This is our radiology. So this is an x-ray machine. X-rays, which used to be all we had uh, for, for diagnostics, to look inside of a body, unless we opened them up, was, was to, to, uh, to irradiate them with some x-ray down here. There'd be a film, a canister down here with some film. The, uh, th this this uh, cathode ray produces x-rays that go down there, and depending on the thickness of the tissue, we could see the differences. It's still a, a very important part of our practice, mostly for bones. We, we can look at bones very well. But for a lot of things, what we do now, we, we use ultrasound. Uh, this is endoscopy, so we can put a scope down the, the mouth of the dog and look around, go all the way down in the intestines. We can take biopsies. We can pull things out. Uh, endoscopy, and, and uh, first I've got some very smart colleagues who know how to use an uh, ultrasound. Uh, when I was in school, we didn't have ultrasound. It was, wasn't even out yet. Uh, they were starting to talk about it. It was starting to come to the human side. Uh, now it's a, a vital part of, of, of what we do. Ultrasound allows us to, to basically wave a magic wand over, over the, the uh, say, the abdomen. And, and by reading the, the, the way the sound waves travel through different tissues, we can make a lot of sense to a computer about what's going on there. So we can look at the liver. We can see tumors in the liver. We can see the normal... Ex uh, tech, uh, um, a, a texture of the liver or the, the spleen or the kidneys. So it's a really, really powerful um, modality. And the animals can be awake. We don't have to anesthetize them. They don't have to, uh, there's no scalpels, there's no cutting. Uh, you know, the, we're, when we're finished, we put them down and they go home. So it's a, it's a very, very nice technique. And uh, lots of new things coming out. The, uh, ultrasound, I think, in the next 20 years is going to be able to do a lot of even 3D stuff for us now. Even now, we can, we're, it's starting to give us, we can look at the heart, we can look at the chambers of the heart, we can make all the measurements, we can see blood flowing different directions, and there's, there's, there's different colors that they're coming up with now that you can determine different types of, of tissues and, 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 uh, and oxygenation and bloods and, as opposed to non-oxygenation. So, again, really cool stuff coming up for, for this. And, and again, you guys are all going to be at the, at, at, the, at, the, at the thrust of this. This is our, um, our dog ward. So... Uh, if dogs are hospitalized, this is where they go. Or after surgery, we tend to recover them there. And then we have a similar thing for cats. And it's called a cat ward, oddly enough. Um, I don't know why that's in there. <laughs> this is Krista's dog, and it is the nuttiest creature on this planet. So, and, and I, Krista, Krista really did a lot of work for me here. And if I forget to thank Krista Fenner for, for all the work she did, she really help put this together, and she's a, she's a marvelous uh, uh, assistant and, and works very hard at my clinic, and, and I overpay her. <laughs> this is our kennel. So and this, this is for healthy animals. We do this for, uh, like over Christmas, if you're going to leave your pet somewhere, we can, we can put them in here. But we, we have a lot, because we're, it's a, this, this kennel, unlike many other kennels associated with a vet clinic, so we can, like diabetics or, or older patients with, with arthritis or such, and, and with other problems, medical problems, we get a lot more of those than, than just your standard, uh, someone's going away for the weekend, would you watch my dog? So I'm going to look at a couple of case studies, and, and again, the, the, some of this is kind of neat stuff, because a lot of what I do is I go to an exam room, and the animal's fine, and I look at the teeth, and I might give an injection, for a vaccine, and, and we talk a little bit about what, uh, what's been going on and, and what they may be seeing in the future as, as time goes on with their particular pet. But again, occasionally we get some very cool things. And so we're going we're gonna to look at, a, at, at these four different uh, cases that we just picked out of, out of all the things that we do at the clinic and, and go through a, through a few of them. Um, so feline ovar ovarian hysterectomy, that's a spay, commonly called a spay. So the way to render a female cat incapable of producing kittens is to go in and take her ovaries and her uterus out. We take everything out. 
Uh, there are techniques for leaving the ovaries in where you just take out the uterus. They'd still not be able to have kittens, but we, we tend to get a lot of secondary hormonal problems. So in this country, and in other countries it's different, in this country we tend to do these complete ovarian hysterectomies. You know, we, we talk a lot about a spay like it's an easy thing, and, and, and guys, I, I, you know, when I worked at the shelter and such, I've, I've done probably close to 10,000 spays in my life. I've done a whole bunch of them. I sometimes feel I could, do, I could do it with my eyes closed, but it is not an easy procedure. It is a full intra-abdominal procedure where we're going to remove a full organ, an organ that has blood pumping to it, and if you do something wrong, things can go bad very quickly. And I'm very quick to tell my staff and, again, my, my, my colleagues that this is never just a spay. This can be a very, very complicated procedure. And I often say if, if I only did one spay a year, it would be one of those things that I would not sleep well the night before knowing I had to do it. It can be a very complicated procedure. But, again, we do a lot of them. And, and again, for one single reason, to, to stop uh, reproduction in these animals. So Carol here is shaving this animal. Um, this is Liz. She's a third-year student up at CSU. She comes down and helps us out on her vacations. Um, and so here's what I'm scrubbing. So uh, any kind of surgery, uh, the surgeon has to scrub. So we have a scrub sink. I do the same thing, uh, 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 and it's not just washing our hands. We have a, there's a specific thing, and again, I've done it so many times that I, I don't even think about it, but there's a specific pattern that I go through. And I go through each plane of, my, of every finger, up through my wrist, through the other hand. I do that three times, and it's all secondary to me, but Again, the, the, what, your, what, what happens here in our, in our clinic is the same thing that would happen to you if you ended up going into the hospital for a hysterectomy. It's, it's about the same thing. You wouldn't have fur, um, which is, so here we, we've, we've shaved off all the fur. She's prepping that area, and now we're bringing them into surgery. So this is a heated table. They're all hooked up to monitors, which there's an EKG monitor. There's a, what's called a pulse oximeter, so I know how much oxygen is in their bloodstream at any time. That's been a real big change. When I, when I got out of vet school, again, the way I knew if an animal was doing okay was if it was breathing. And that was, that was not very good. And, and, and a lot of my clients have horror stories about 20 years ago or 25 years ago because, uh, you know, a full 10 or 15 percent of animals that went in for a standard procedure like this wouldn't come out. They'd die in, in surgery. Now, it's... Uh, I can't remember the last time we lost a, 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 a spay or something. It's a very, very, very small amount of animals. And, it, and if it happens, it's because of, an, of a reaction to the anesthetic agents. Um, so I'm making an incision here in the belly. So this cat's laying on her back, and I'm making an incision right down here on the belly. I make it as small as I can because I want to be able to, the, 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 the bigger it is, that just takes me longer to close it up. And sometimes I have to really, and in fact, on this cat, I had to open him up a little bit longer. She was kind of an unusual cat because she was a year old, and she wasn't spayed yet, and she didn't have kittens. That's kind of odd. So I, I kept thinking. I wasn't always all the time convinced I was going to find a uterus in here, but we did. So that last picture was a uterus. Um, what, what's, this is an ovary, and I wish you could see up here because it's a kind of a nice picture. The, this is the ovarian artery. So, so what I've done here is I've, I've uh, Chris, could you go back to that, the previous one? I've reached in with this hook, and I've pulled out. This is, a, this is what's called a horn of the uterus. So dogs and cats have, the, have, a, have a kind of a different uterus than humans do, and they have these long horns that lead up to their, to their ovaries. That's because they have 8 or 10 or 12 or 14 puppies and kittens, and they need all that extra room. So I, I put this little hook down there, and I kind of know where this is going to be or should be, and then I pull it out, and then I work my way down with my finger till I can get to this ovary. And I break down this ligament, pull this out, and then the important part here is, is ligation. So ligation is taking suture and closing off these, these vessels so they don't bleed. So what I've done here is I've, I've put a clamp on this end of the ovary, and this is the, the, the artery, the ovarian artery, and I'm running a, a needle through that stump, as it's called, and I'm going to tie that off so it doesn't bleed. I'm going to do the same thing to the other side. There's two ovaries, left and right. So this, this is, a, again, going back a little bit, but this is, I, I just did this to, to show this kind, of, kind of how the ovary or the, the uterus looks. This is, this is the, so this is going like, if this cat was, this is the tail would be down here. This is the bottom. This is what's called the body of the uterus, and then the right and left horns of the uterus, and the, and the right and left over, ovaries. And again, that whole, that whole structure comes out. So at this point, it is all out. The stump is, is in, this, in my clamp there. I'm tying that off also, and then I'm done. Everything goes back in there. I make sure there's nothing bleeding, and then I close the skin up. And that's, that's kind of dirty, but that's how it looks. We clean it up a little bit afterwards. 
I, we, we tend to. I, I can do one in about 14 minutes. I've got a colleague who can do them in eight. You know, it's a kind of a thing that we do to practice even do them the quickest. When you're doing a lot of them in a shelter situation, because you're, you know, you're kind of, you, you've got to do 15 or 20 of them in a morning's time. When I worked at the shelter, I would go in there in the mornings and, and try to knock out 15 or 20 spays and neuters and then get to my other clinic. So you, you get to be pretty fast. These days, I don't, I, I'm lazy and I take my time. And this is a cat, and this is just literally minutes later. We, we have really, really cool anesthetics. In the old days, we gave these guys barbiturates. Barbiturates are kind of uh, archaic. We don't even have them in our clinic anymore. These days, we use basically the same kind of things you would get at the hospital, these disassociates, and, and, uh, and we use a lot of gases. That, that cat was, was intubated. There was a tube putting in, into his trachea, or her trachea, and she was hooked up to a gas that kept her asleep through this whole procedure. And now we transfer her into this warm cage, and she doesn't look too happy, but and, uh, she'll be up and walking around in an hour, and we'll send her home in a couple hours. Again, you know, always when, when humans, because we're kind of wimpy, we go to the hospital, say, for, for a hysterectomy, you're there for probably a week. It, it, is, it is three or four days at least, if there aren't any complications. Uh, you know, we send these guys home the same night. We have them up and eating the next morning, and I tell them if they're not up and eating that next morning to call me, because that should happen. So these guys recover very quick. A lot of that we try to take credit for because we've gotten good at this, but a lot of it is also that dogs and cats are pretty tough. Okay, now, now we're going to look at a laceration, and this is Starla. She's an, an intact female, means that she is not neutered. That's, you know, again, not always a good thing. When I see those dogs come in, my first thing is, is trying to talk to them about maybe the, the benefits of, of spaying and neutering these guys. Um, this guy was unfortunately a breeder. Um, and, you know, and, and again, I don't, I don't want to get into the ethics of it, but not a great thing. She was attacked because she's in heat, and I, this is all kind of... I thought this was, this was about the ugliest picture I could come up with. That's why we put it in there. But this is her tail. Her anus is right here. So we're looking right underneath her tail. She was attacked here because she's in heat. And the male dogs were just beating the hell out of her, heck, the heck out of her. And that happens a lot. That's another good reason to get your dog spayed and neutered. You can, you can eliminate. When I was working the shelter, almost every dog that I would see would be an intact male or get hit by a car. Uh, almost always hit by cars were intact males because they were out looking for females. And if they found one, then, then they tried to breed them. If not, they beat them up pretty bad. It's, you know, it's kind of a rough life. So here's this incision. This is Monica. Uh, Monica is, is getting ready to, to start uh, her schooling for, for veterinarian technician school. She's been with us for a couple of years. She's, she's very good as it is, but she's decided to go back and get a degree. She's going to do that online. So that's, a, that's a kind of a neat thing that you guys can do in the future. And, and I've got some information here. And if you get, have any questions about any of this, call the clinic and ask for Krista and she'll help you out. So obviously an overweight dog, again, not a good thing. An intact dog, not a good thing. This guy left without paying me, not a good thing, but still. Um, so we're cleaning up that incision. And again, I'm gowned. I don't always do this, depending on what we're doing. I, I did this mostly because I knew you guys were going to see it. But sometimes I, I usually have a mask on. Uh, if it's a dirty wound like this, and, and sterility is not that important, we are going to take this into the surgical, into the surgical suite. We're going to do it right here in treatment. So we'll clean that wound up as best we can, and then I'll drape it. And that's going to be a little bit of a problem. A lot of these things that we're going to talk about, we're, we're, this is what's called a drape, and, that's, and it's something that's sterile. So we have this, this, this machine called an autoclave. So when we're done, all these instruments, all of our drapes, anything that we use in surgery goes into an autoclave. It heats it up to a very high temperature, at very high pressure, kills all the bacteria, so, and then it's wrapped up. I unwrap it right before I use it, so it is still sterile. There's no bacteria on it. My gloves are sterile. Sterility is a really important thing here. Because if you get bacteria inside this wound, you really kind of make things worse, which is kind of the goal here is not to make things worse. Uh, part of what I had to do here, and, and, and part of my concern with this wound was that it didn't go into the anus or it didn't go into the vagina. I didn't know how deep it was. So I had to explore it a little bit to make sure I knew exactly what I was getting into. But fortunately, it was, it was a deep wound, but it didn't, didn't enter any other structures. That's my respectful staff. So here I am, and this is what's called the subcutaneous. So we just don't, you just can't close the skin. I have to go down and I identify these, these, these muscle layers. I look for vessels, for nerves. I know where I am and what I'm doing, and I start closing this up with the suture. Suture is really cool stuff now, too. So it's like thread with a big needle on the end of it, but come a long way. It's, uh, 
it um, uh, is now, most of it is, is very, very strong and yet absorbable so that we can leave it, we can bury it in the skin here and it'll stay there and become absorbed so we don't have to go in and take it out. What I've done here, and I don't know if you can see these, there's four very small little, what are called sutures or stitches of this suture material. And then over the top of that, I'll, I'll close the skin. We tend to do a lot of these what are called inner dermal patterns. So I'll, I won't, there won't be, won't be sutures or stitches to take out. I'll do this in the skin and bury the knot so you can't see it. That, that way they don't have to come back for me to take it. I did not want this dog to come back anyway. She wasn't very pleasant. And uh, she was asleep when, so she couldn't bite me, but the staff was having uh, other issues. And then, of course, we found another one. This was something we tried not to do, but we, we, we found another lesion when we were getting ready to close up, so I quickly put a suture in that. Again, she's an overweight pit bull. But, you know, and I, don't, I, I love pit bulls. They're, they're, they're great. I could have probably done this suit if she wouldn't have been so mean without anesthesia because they are, they are tough. They will let you do almost anything. I, veterinarians tend to love pit bulls. They tend to be very good with people. They're, they can be rough on cats and chickens. And, and, and fighting these dogs, obviously, that's a, that's a horrible thing, and, I, and I'm glad we passed that law last year prohibiting that in our state. So really a nice dog once we got her out and got her up, and, and now... Uh, of course, a female dog is a bitch, and I was going to make this comment about my other staff member here because she deserves it, but I won't. So she's going home, and we've got some medication for her, and uh, uh, she'll be, she'll be uh, the next morning as good as new. This will heal without any problems. She's probably pregnant. What can you say? Am I doing okay on, on time here, Bob? I've, okay. Um, the, the cruise ship. And this is what in humans we call an ACL injury. This is a very, very common thing in dogs also. So you're, this is going to be, you're not going to be able to see most of this because it's all draped up. But I, I kind of wanted to go through, show you some of the procedures we do and see how similar they are because I, I had my cruciate repaired uh, several years ago and it was pretty much the same thing that happened here. Um, this, this is a picture just trying to show this is the, the tibia, this is the femur, these are, these, this is the, the, the kneecap and this is the, the uh, patellar ligament. Inside here, can you go back to that other thing? So inside, so this is looking at your knee, it would be the same thing from the side. And there's these two ligaments that hold these two bones together. A lot of other tissues that hold those two bones, but these are the predominant ones. They stop these bones from being able to move this way. And this is called the, again, in humans, called the anterior cruciate. In, in animals, we call it the cranial cruciate. It's the same thing. That one tends to rupture, mostly with dogs chasing rabbits. Rabbits will make that 90-degree turn at full speed. A dog tries to do that, and that twisting, popping thing, he'll, he'll blow that. He'll just pop that, that ligament free. And then he, he, that's, a, that's a painful thing. He won't be able to walk normally on it. So what we're going to do is try to go in there and fix that. And this is Bella. She's uh, how old? A couple of years? A year and a half. And this is, some of my staff doesn't like to get their pictures taken, that's why we take them. Um, so what we're doing here is we're, she's got an IV catheter, and a catheter is something we put into a vein. We will run, this tube here is running fluids to her. This is a, this is a longer procedure, so we tend to hook these guys up to fluids, just like you would get in the hospital. Um, through the catheter, we're injecting some diazepam, some Valium, to kind of relax her. Then we'll give her a narcotic on top of that. Then we will put a tube down into her trachea and hook her up into this gas machine. So she's completely asleep, but well controlled. You know, again, she's hooked up to monitors. Um, we, know, we know what's going on. I'm looking at her EKG. I know, I know what her heart's doing. Um, this is Dr. Cameron who's doing, actually doing this procedure. This is something we do in some of these more uh, painful procedures, and this is an epidural. So what we'll do is take this long needle, and humans get these a lot, uh, pregnancies, a lot, of, a lot of women will get an epidural for a pregnancy. It just takes the bottom half of your body and takes all the nerves out because we put an anesthetic agent right in the spinal column. So that's what we're doing here. That'll kill all the nerves to the hind legs and she won't feel any of this procedure. We still have her asleep, but it, it is nice for pain control when she wakes up. So she's shaved here from the epidermal. Now should we bring her into the surgery table? She's covered in some heating units to keep her warm. We're also monitoring her temperature through this whole procedure. Um, this is a technician. She's a, actually, she's a third-year vet student, and she's gloving up. Again, the whole scrub, the whole thing, the all sterile stuff. The leg is, is hung up there so we, can, so we can as sterilely get to that as we can. We use this technique where, where we take actually aluminum foil, 
and put that in the autoclave. So this is sterile, so the surgeon can handle that. He can wrap that foot up. That allows him to handle that leg with, without him, because you can't touch the fur. Once, you can't touch anything that's not sterile. Once you've got your gloves on, and if, if you would touch something, the technicians, you know, they're, they're, they're all trained. If we, if we bump into something, we've got to change our gloves, sometimes change our gowns. So sterility is a really important thing, especially when we're going into a joint and into a bone. So again, I, I, I wish I could uh, show you this a little bit better, but most of this is going to be under drape and you're not going to be able to see this. But Dr. Cameron has, has made an incision over the front of the knee, and now he's going to go in and actually go and pull the kneecap off of this joint and look inside there where those ligaments are. So that's what's going on here. <laughs> this is actually that ligament. And again, this is all going to be kind of hard to see, but what we, what we attempt to do this, though, is stabilize this knee. So here's what we do. We take two spots on the top of the knee and on the bottom of the knee, and we take this very heavy suture. Uh, it's about 80 pounds stuff. It is, it is very, very hard. And we will connect those two, two points. So basically what we try to do is mimic the, the work of that ligament and try to replace that ligament. And we have these special uh, tools that we use to clamp things down. We have to tighten this down, and, we, and again, we have a, a lot of these really cool new uh, um, uh, uh, surgical instruments that allow us to do this f fairly effectively and, and, and quickly, which is, you know, surgery is always about getting in and getting out. These guys are on anesthesia. Their body temperature is dropping. They're, everything's changing in there, so you want to hurry as much as you can. And that's my, uh, one of my head technicians, Carol. Carol's actually got a PhD in anthropology and then decided she wanted to do something she enjoyed and got a, got a, a degree in, uh, in, and became a veterinarian technician. Uh, we're basically done here now. Dr. Cameron's getting ready to close this knee up. And there we are. Ta-da. Now, again, I know that that wasn't, it wasn't extremely informative as far as the surgical procedure, but what I was kind of trying to show you is the things that we do as veterinarians and as surgeons is is about the same that you'd get at St. Vincent's. I like to think a little bit better. <laughs> so here's a dog in recovery. Again, now we've got this line again is hooked up to a bag of fluids up here. We are running narcotics. This dog's getting morphine and fentanyl. Um, we keep these guys pretty sleepy through, through this whole night. This dog will sleep this off in a narcotic haze. We, we do, a, we do a, uh, what's called a, a drip system to them where we're, they're getting narcotics all the time. They don't even wake up. But it's very safe. They're, they're, we, we can stir them if we need to, but we want them just to sleep this off. This kind of hurts, so we don't want them to be in any pain. That's been a big thing in veterinary medicine in the last 20 years that I've been out. We used to do these procedures with, with no narcotics. And uh, um, we, we've come a really, really long way in pain control in veterinary medicine. It's now, now a huge thing. Uh, when we do spays and neuters, they all go home on pain stuff. We never used to do that, but they all do now. And we're very conscious about about what we do for pain control. So this is a nice gross one that I thought we'd throw in here. Um, go back real quick. This is, so this is Bogey. And uh, Bogey was limping on, one, on, on his hind foot. And uh, when I looked in there, I saw this. My staff loves that word, bulbous. This big bulbous mass sitting between, between the pads. And uh, um, it was causing some pain. Obviously a tumor, though. That was a concern to me, that this was some sort of cancer. And when things start to grow, that's not right, and you've got to get those out and figure out what's going on. So this is, this is the foot that we're looking at again. So here's Bogey's got a tube. He's asleep. He's got a tube in his mouth. He's hooked up here to his tongue to this pulse oximeter. And we're still in treatment now. We haven't moved into the, into the surgical area. Um, this is Dr. Iser. She's my oncologist. An oncologist studies cancer, and that's her thing. She loves cancer. Go figure. Um, um, go back just real quick to that. So a, a lot of these cases, like all veterinarians, we, you know, we, we, have, we, don't, we don't have big egos, and I, we're, I'm always asking for help from my colleagues, and we're always sharing cases. That's, that's an important part of our profession is that we all try to get involved and know what's going on. Um, so I was asking Dr. Iser just for her opinion on this. We will do a, a fine needle aspirate. I think we got, uh, got a picture of that. Here's Carol again. So what I'm doing here... Is th this is that mass. So here's the pads. This is all normal. This is not normal. That should not be there. So here I'm sticking a needle into that, and I'm going to draw out some cells. I'll give that to, to, to Dr. Isert. She'll go look at those cells and try to tell me what it is. Um, 
Some of that will determine on how aggressive, if this was a really, if she came back and said, this is a mast cell tumor, it's hot, it's a bad thing, then I would call the owner and say, we should probably take off this leg. So they're, they're, th those are some of the decisions that, that Dr. Eisert will help me make with, with what's going on here about how aggressive we will get with this surgery. This appeared to be a benign mass, so we, we went to surgery and just decided to take that, the, take that tumor off. And again, scrubbing, gowning, gloving, my uh, assistant falling asleep. So here I am. Th th this is the mass, and it had this kind of ulcerated edge. When, when she was walking on it, she wore some of that skin off of it. This is a scalpel blade. A scalpel blade is a very, very sharp little knife. I'm coming underneath there. I have this with my skin, and I'm just trying to remove it. There's going to be a fair amount of bleeding. I, I expect that. And I get out there. And then, then I, now, now what I do once I get that mass out of the way is I want to try to stop and control the hemorrhage, stop the bleeding. So I, with the vessels that are there, I'll get a clamp on them, and then I'll start sewing things back together. And again, you know, it's not just the sewn skin. You've got to know what tissues are. Close the tissues over things. Close the skin over the top of that. And there, there's a finished product. And again, you can't even really tell that was there. There's a small incision. This came back as what's called a collagenless nevi. There it is again when I, after we took it out. It's kind of cool, isn't it? It's not an olive. Uh, so that was, that was called a collagenous nevi, very benign growth. So fortunately, this dog is cured. We're done. Wrap the leg up and uh, home to milk and cookies. I got, uh, oh, this is one we just, because this is about right, because I should probably be wrapping this up. Um, this is one we just saw t this morning. And this dog came in. It was a neat case. That's why I threw it in here. Uh, this dog weighed 58 pounds. The owner said he, he weighed 70 pounds three weeks ago, dropping weight like crazy, occasionally vomiting, occasionally diarrhea, but basically acting pretty good. So we did a couple x-rays. Go to the next x-ray, because I want to show that one first. This is the first x-ray we did of the abdomen to try to see what was going on. And the first thing when I looked at this, I said, there's no intestines in here. Here's the colon. The, the, here's the liver, but there are no intestines. And if you don't look at these all the time, you guys wouldn't recognize that. But I, I mean, I said, this isn't right. Something, something's really off here. So we went back and took a picture of the chest. And here's the chest. And again, if you don't look at these a lot, you probably can't understand it. But this is a dog laying on, on his side. This is his spinal cord. These are his shoulders up here. These are his shoulder blades. His forearms would be here. His head would be here. His hind limbs here. His tail out here. This is his heart. This is his trachea. These are where his lungs are and should be. But the, the, the odd part here is that all this kind of fuzzy stuff here, this, this gas, this loopy gas stuff, those are his intestines. His intestines should be in his abdomen, not in his chest. This dog has what's called a diaphragmatic hernia. And, and we, have, we get these too. It's just, it's a, the, again, the anatomy here is exactly the same. You have lungs and heart in your chest. You have stomach and liver and spleen and, and intestines and colon and urinary bladder in your belly. And there's this thing called the, the diaphragm that separates those two structures. If your diaphragm gets a hole in it and air gets into your chest, that's a bad thing because that, the chest has to be a negative pressure for you to breathe properly. Something bad happened to this dog, probably hit by car, but the owner said, was, was, was adamant. This dog had not been out of his yard. Nothing had ever gone wrong with it. The dog had been spayed a couple of, of months earlier. None of this really made sense to me. And again, I think somehow this dog got over the fence, got hit by a car, and got back, because there aren't too many other things that'll do this. So the way to fix this, and unfortunately, this, this is not an easy procedure. I've done them many times, and I was, I was kind of excited to do it, but unfortunately not a cheap procedure. I was telling this gentleman this is going to cost between $1,000 and $1,500. With, with still, it's a, it's a difficult thing because there's all up in that chest, all those, those intestines are forming adhesions. We're going to have to drag all that stuff down in the inte uh, into the belly and then go up and, and close that diaphragm up and get the lungs to reinflate. It's a long, difficult, and, and, uh, and very dangerous procedure that, that could go either way. So I don't know what's going to happen with this dog. The gentleman took him home, and he's going to think about things, but it's... it's uh, the dog's doing fine now, but the future is unfortunately very, very bad for this guy because he, he can't eat. He can't, if he, if he eats something and, and the food gets into his intestines, they swell up with, with gas and such. He starts to, he, his lungs can't expand. He starts to have problems breathing. You know, you can do this for a while, but for not very long. This, he probably won't live more than a couple of weeks with this procedure unless, unless something's done. 
Okay, I think I'm probably about done, and you guys are probably about ready to get out of here, and your rides are showing up. Um, I thank all of you for being here. I know.